let's start our celebration, shall we? Standing outside the door of love and mercy, you wonder if there's a place there for you. You know there's peace inside, but still you're searching for someone who understands the pain you've been through. While the door's unlocked, the lights are on. What are you waiting for? Come on. as well as it is the first night of Hanukkah. I am Dina Shimmick and I am so honored to be up here representing our Unity spiritual community as one half of our dynamic duo. Reverend Lawrence is at Delray this morning giving not one but two talks. But we are so blessed to have Bev Spivey here with us as always giving our talk. And our amazing musical team led by James McCoy. Let's give it up for them. Uh, good morning. We're very fortunate to have Mr. Peter Wallace with us on piano this morning. Mr. Jeff Renz at the drum set again this morning. Our featured soloist is Samantha Natalie Wallace. And as you might be able to see, we've brought out the serious hardware this morning for the music today. So get ready. Get ready. And to everyone watching at home comfortably, hello to you, all of our live streamers from far away, from close by on your PJs, welcome. <laughs> and we this year have really embodied this message of one humanity and many stories throughout 2019. We all see us as a diverse group of people from different backgrounds, different ways of thinking and being, but yet we come together in our oneness and we honor that. And now as we take this time together to get centered, let's close our eyes and take a deep breath. Sweet Spirit, thank you for this time we have together, for putting aside anything that isn't in the harmony of this joyous, loving, peaceful time of year. We feel the love and the joy in this community through our music, through the talk, through strangers and loved ones in this congregation, we feel whole and we are so gratitude to have this time together, to be infused with the harmony, the sweet spirit and the joy of this time of year. We feel the gratitude and love in that and so it is, amen. And now in our fourth week of Advent, I'd like to call up Joey Posey who will light the candle for joy. Good morning, everybody. My name is Joey, and I've been a member here for a few years with my partner, Julie. 
And this has been an interesting time of year for me because some of you are going to laugh. I am turning 40 years old tomorrow. <laughs> And, uh, and it's been hitting me. It's fun. I know it's a young one for, for some of you, but uh, I've been feeling it. <laughs> and, and I've really been channeling joy. Joy has been coming up in my life as a message. It's been delivered to me, and I'm really joyful, and I'm really grateful to be part of this spiritual community and to be down here in South Florida in the dead of winter, and it's 70-something degrees. I'm very grateful. And with that, the daily word for today, Sunday, December 22nd, is joy. My greatest joy is discovering the presence of God within me. Unity co-founder Charles Fillmore wrote that joy is, quote, the happiness of God expressed through his perfect idea, humankind. Witnessing the unbridled joy of children on Christmas morning brings a smile to my face and gives me a warm feeling. Although my childhood may be a distant memory, joy remains an active part of my life. I find joy in the beauty of holiday decorations, in the fellowship of family and friends, and in giving and receiving gifts. I discover that my greatest joy is knowing and feeling the presence of God within me. I recognize and rejoice in God's presence in me and see it in everyone I meet. I know that joy is always present and can be called into expression at every moment. And the reading is from Galatians 5.22. The fruit of spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, and faithfulness. And now I will light the Advent candles. The first candle representing hope and faith. The next representing peace. The next representing love. Finally, joy. Let's everyone please stand. Let's sing Joy to the World. like to give a warm welcome to anyone who is here for the very first time. If you could be so courageous and raise your hand, we have a little something for you. Welcome. Welcome. Please know you and everyone else is welcome next door through the double doors for fellowship time right after the service where we have some treats together and some loving spiritual conversation. 
Also, you can go on our webpage, www.unitypompanobeach.org, for all of our happenings, all of our upcoming classes and events here for the season. Prayer is very important to us. We have a dedicated group of parachaplains ready and willing to sit with you in the silence or share prayer time with you. They come in 30 minutes before the service and after the service, and they are in the first room on the right when you go through the double doors, ready to have affirmative prayer with you. Also, at the end of the service, you will see many of them line up around the sanctuary, and they are here for you to have that prayer for you. And we also have burst excuse me, blue prayer slips in the chair backs that you could fill out at any time during the service. It can go into the offering plate or it can go into our prayer box that comes up during the meditation time. Those are prayed over by our prayer chaplains and then sent to Unity Village where they are prayed over 24 seven for 30 days. So that is some powerful stuff. Please take advantage of our prayer. Our announcements for today. Very exciting. In two days, Christmas Eve, we have our candlelight service. It is a beautiful time to come. If you have friends and family around and in town, bring them. If you don't come because you'll be amongst this beautiful spiritual community, we're going to have fellowship open right afterwards so that you could stay and have conversation and enjoy some holiday goodies together. So that is from 7 to 8 p.m. right here in the sanctuary. Then we have one of... I was just going to say there will be punch and cookies, too, so don't forget that part. And Samantha and Pete will be here as well. If you didn't need another reason, that alone is, is reason to come out for our service. They're amazing. It's going to be a great way to start your Christmas Eve and Christmas time together. And then a week from then on our New Year's Eve is one of my favorite, the Burning Bowl Ceremony. It will be here from 7 to 8 p.m., and we go ahead and release anything we do not want to bring into 2020. We literally write it on paper and put it to fire and release that. So we don't want to be carrying around anything that doesn't serve us anymore, old thoughts, old beliefs, maybe the name of a few people you want to release. That is fine, and this is a perfect time to do it. So put that on your calendar as well. New Year, new book, The Talented, our very own licensed Unity teacher, Cynthia who leads our Power Hour group, is doing a new book in this upcoming year, The Quest for Wholeness. Um, so look forward to the new year. It's going to be the same time, same place as always. They're going to get started with this new book. If you have any more questions, you could ask Cynthia about that. What was formerly known as Reignite Your Light Summit is now Infinite Possibilities, and we are lucky enough to be hosting it right here. We have a huge sanctuary. We would love to see it filled for this. Our very own Bev Spivey, Reverend Lawrence will be two of the speakers. We also have Del Miguel Ruiz Jr., who I know many of you know and follow him. We are very blessed to have um, a promo going on just for this congregation, a two for one that ends today. If you go on their webpage, you just have to punch in at the top that two for one code and you'll get that. If you want to gift a friend, this would be a lovely uh, gift for the holidays and then we also have and that's on our webpage that you can access that code and then also we have for anyone who wants to come on their own a $35 off and that goes until the first of the year so make sure you go ahead and get your tickets for that it's going to be a great event on the 11th of January also in the new year our licensed unity teacher Cynthia again and our prayer chaplain and Director of Operations, Ron, I see you back there, will be leading the five laws of stratospheric success. And this is going to bring spiritual success to all aspects of your life. They are using the go-giver and also some wisdom from Eric Butterworth's spiritual economics. And this will be starting January 14th as our regular Tuesday class for the new year. So we look forward to seeing you there. And on that note, I believe it's time for us to stand and greet one another.
Well, good morning. As we settle into our seats, let us get ourselves ready now for a time of meditation. So I'm going to read a little bit of reading to you about joy from our Advent booklet. Since this is our Advent Sunday of joy. What a blessing it is to feel deep joy. The kind of joy when your heart could just burst with fullness. When your body shimmers with quiet excitement and the world feels more colorful, more alive, and all good things feel possible. Opportunities abound for joyous experiences during the holiday season. The parties, the time spent with friends and family, decorating, perhaps cooking and baking. And it can be easy to feel grateful for the joy the Christmas season brings. Having an act of gratitude practice creates a fertile ground for joy to grow and flower in consciousness. But what about those circumstances and events that siphon your joy? How can you be grateful for things you didn't choose, don't want, or don't like? The key is to look within your negative experience and find something, anything, however small, to feel grateful for. Sometimes this practice is simple. Plans canceled because of inclement weather. Try gratitude for warmth and shelter. Sometimes it's more challenging during a loss or illness, in grief or depression, but maybe you can find gratitude for the love shown to you by friends and family. So joy is meant to be shared. Let your gratitude practice extend to your friends and family, in church, at work, at school, at home. They will feel your gratitude, and all will multiply your joy. And so this affirmation is, on this day of Advent, I will start counting my blessings. And so it is. So let's now prepare for a time of meditation by singing together. words together let us feel comfortable let us feel our breath and let it move easily through our body find a comfortable relaxing spot in your seat let your arms and legs relax relax your head your shoulders your neck And relax your thoughts now as we take a breath together hold it for a moment and release and another breath and release and feel it moving all through your body as we tune into 
our inner sanctum right now. We know that no matter what's going on, whether we're frantic, busy, bored, tired, no matter what, we can turn our thoughts to this place. But how can we feel joy? Joy is a treat that we don't allow ourselves on a daily basis sometimes. We can feel good. We can even feel happy. But is the joy there? What does it take to feel joy? It doesn't take everything going well. In fact, sometimes the fullness of joy can come to you when you're at your lowest. Joy comes from spirit. Joy is within us always. And if we're not used to feeling it, we begin with gratitude, with thinking of what we're grateful for. And that begins the bubbly feeling of, yes, I can feel joy. Yes. I can feel joy, and when I feel joy, it powers me up. It's soothing, it's comforting, and powerful. So let us take a few moments in silence and allow your mind to feel gratitude for little things, for big things, for people in your life, for places. Let us take these moments to feel gratitude and then let that gratitude build our joy for a few moments in the silence. in gratitude for this season to remind us of our blessings, in gratitude for this season of sharing and giving. We hold joy in our heart through it all, and so it is. Amen. And as we return to this place, let us sing together, Alleluia.
Everything inside me cries for order Everything inside me wants to hide Is this shadow an angel or a warrior? If God is pleased with me, why am I so terrified? Someone tell me I am only dreaming Help me see with heaven's eyes And before my head agrees My heart is on its knees Holy is he Blessed am I trembling heart somehow I believe that you chose me I'll hold you in the beginning you will hold me in the end every moment in the middle make my heart your Bethlehem be born All this time we've waited for a promise All this time you've waited for my arms Did you wrap yourself inside the unexpected So we might know that love would go that far trembling heart somehow I believe that you chose me I'll hold you in the beginning you will hold me in the end every moment in the middle make my heart to Bethlehem be born The only thing my heart can offer is a vacancy. I'm just a girl, nothing more. But I am willing, I am yours. Mm. Ooh. Be born in me.
Thank you so much, Samantha and Pete. And they will be joining us Christmas Eve, and I guarantee you we will enjoy that very much. Thank you. Well, good morning and Merry Christmas. Here we are, fourth Sunday of Advent. You can't miss it by now. We're down to ready or not. Here it comes, right? Well, we, Lawrence, during this month of December, has talked with you about a broader idea of Advent. Yes, it's the crumbing of Christmas, of birthing the Christ nature, as we say in unity. But it's also a look back, starting with Genesis, in the biblical times. What did the scriptures mean? It was all about recognizing a human need for longing, a human need of longing. We still have that today, don't we? Sometimes there's a longing. There's often a feeling of need. And the Bible stories through the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures carried us on through reminding of God's promise to Israel and onward to the people of the world. You will be my people and I will be your God. And that has filled fulfilled itself in the Hebrew scriptures. So I'm going to talk to you about that today, a little bit of history, and also talk about Mary's song and how the symbology of that is still with us today. Well, today is also Hanukkah, and 165 BC is when this event occurred that Jew the Jews still celebrate today. After three years, of a real strong battle with improbable odds, the Jews actually succeeded in defeating their Syrian oppressors, and they took control of Jerusalem again. And when they went in to dedicate the temple, they discovered that all of the ritual oil had been destroyed. But they found one vial that was still sealed, and they used it to light the temple menorah. It was enough for one day. But do you know it burned for eight days? And in that eight days, it gave them time to press new oil and have it sanctified by the priest, and they could continue keeping that temple menorah lit. That is what the Jews have celebrated now for 2,184 years, and we celebrate Hanukkah with them today. But Hanukkah doesn't have anything to do with Christmas. It just happens to fall at this time. Why does it fall at this time? Well, our Christmas originated with celebrating the winter solstice. And nowadays, we don't even think much about the solstice unless we come out to drumming circles. Um, the solstice actually occurred here, I think about 4 a.m. Uh, this morning, too cloudy to see the sun. But we have uncovered in uh, ancient days they believe that at least 10,000 BC in the Stone Age, the cultures of the time celebrated the winter solstice. This is a photo from Stonehenge dated 3000 BC. Well, not the photo, obviously. <laughs> of the sunrise on the winter solstice. And some of you have been to Machu Picchu and know how the Temple of the Sun there, uh, the stones line up so that the sunrise is there on a solstice. These people, all of those years, used this time of darkness uh, in the northern hemisphere, very cold, and learned that days would get brighter, days would get longer, warm weather would return, and they sacrificed to the unknown gods that must be causing this. They sacrificed, they feasted, and they hoped for the season to appear. And this went on, of course, for thousands of years. The Egyptians uh, celebrated Ra, the god of the sun. The Celts, the Scandinavian Norsemen, the Germanic tribes. When we look through archaeology and history, the known cultures celebrated the winter solstice. And in the Roman Empire, where we get our Christian roots, that was where our celebrations of this time of year began, with their Saturnalia. It began on December 17th with a sacrifice in the Temple of Saturn in the Roman Forum. Some of you have been there. 
and the sacrifice to the sun god, Saturn. And then they had a big public feast, they had gift giving, and they had extreme partying for an entire week. Of anything imaginable, it was open season for party time. And this went on, of course, for thousands of years. So in the Roman Empire, that was the celebration. So what about Christianity? What about the birthday of Jesus? Well, do you know the birthday of Jesus wasn't added to any calendar until the year 336, when Pope Julius I in Rome put it there. So let me backtrack. Nobody knows when Jesus was born. Why? The Jews at that time, and Jesus was Jewish, did not commemorate birthdays. Nobody had a notable birthday. It wasn't noteworthy. They believed that celebrating a birth was a pagan ritual. And so we don't know when Jesus' birthday was. Jesus, his disciples, all of his followers were Jewish. They, his movement was kind of like the unity movement is now. It was a new thought movement within Judaism. It was a new way at looking at what God is and how to celebrate God and how to live while keeping the Jewish laws. There's a misunderstanding sometimes that Jesus came and taught a new religion. No, not at all. Jesus and his followers were observant Jews. They did their daily Shema, morning and evening prayers. They did their ritual foods. Uh, it was at Passover time when Jesus was uh, crucified, and we know that Jesus must have been there for Passover. So with the uh, Jews and Jesus of his day, and the other sects in Judaism, there were Pharisees and Sadducees and Zealots, all with a little bit of different view on things, the way it still is today. They met together for about 50 years after Jesus' death. They still met together. I get my... And so, here appeared... Paul. You may know him as St. Paul or the Apostle Paul. He was another Jew, and he didn't know Jesus, but he became converted from one version of Judaism, being a Pharisee, to the Jesus movement after a mystical experience where he felt and saw and heard Jesus. And in uh, about 30 years after Jesus died, Paul started taking his message across the Mediterranean and into Asia Minor. You see Italy there, and you see the countries around. Now, down in this right-hand corner, you may see a triangular-shaped Sinai Peninsula and the Red Sea there. Um, just know that Paul traveled, and that's how Christianity got to the Roman Empire. There were many Gentiles there who went to the Jewish temples to hear their messages, and they just enjoyed Judaism. So Paul would stand on the uh, steps of the synagogue and speak to the G Gentiles there about the Jesus movement. And so that movement developed. As more and more Gentiles became followers of Jesus, called followers of the way, a controversy developed. Were these converts to be Jews? If so, would they follow the dietary rules, the purity laws? Would the adult males become circumcised? Mostly they said, no way. And so by the second century now, the beginning, you know, after 100 years, um, and it would have been after 60, 70, 80 years after Jesus, the split from Judaism to what we know as Christianity began. Things were much slower then. We didn't have all our global communications like now. But slowly but surely, this Christianity developed 
in the Roman Empire, and the Roman Empire was vast. That's the Roman Empire in yellow. The red spots are places uh, where Paul visited, and uh, this is representing what it looked like by the year 325. And so we get back to Christmas, which wasn't yet, but Saturnalia was. And as you know about many religions today, not unity, of course, but merrymaking sometimes is frowned upon. And the religious hierarchy leading the new Christianity sought to rein in these converts who were now followers of Jesus, so-called Christians, because they all saw Christ as the name for Jesus and the meaning being anointed one. And they were looking for this Messiah to come back any time. So there was a lot of partying going on for 100 years or more. And the church then added, Pope Julius I added, the birthday of Jesus to try to rein in some of the celebrations. So the birthday of Jesus was set at December 25th, which was the final day of the week of Saturnalia, which was really to them the uh, birthday of the unconquerable sun, Saturn. And so they added Jesus' birthday into that and had mass and rituals in the churches and made a big event of Jesus' birthday. Well, of course, it didn't stop the revelry, did it? You know, one thing about joy, no matter what its source is, joy is powerful, right? So the revelry continued. And then we added Advent. Advent was originally a time of fasting and prayer leading up to the birthday of Jesus. So just a little bit of history. Why am I giving you this history, some of you wonder. For me, it was a way to come to grips with what it all means. What does it mean? What did Jesus' crucifixion mean? In the early years, in, in the Jesus movement, even meeting in the temple, or uh, excuse me, they lost the temple through destruction, but meeting in synagogues, meeting in groups, they expected Jesus to return at any moment and bring in a heaven on earth. The idea of the Messiah was that Messiah was a physical, powerful leader who would come in, free the Jews from their thousands of years of oppression, and create a life peaceful life on earth for everybody. They saw the Messiah as creating peace for all. But as the decades went along and Jesus hadn't come back, people began to think, you know, what does it mean? What does it mean? Even as today, you may uncover some ideas, some thoughts, some teachings, maybe through our classes or elsewhere, and it's like, what does it mean? Well, in their first century minds, they developed new belief systems. And they then thought, well, the Messiah must be coming back in an indeterminate time. And this is what the thinking went into in the Roman Empire. However, that thinking went awry from true Judaism, who never ever believed in anything more than one God. And they couldn't latch on or believe in the idea that developed in a couple centuries by the 300s where they came up with this notion of the Trinity, where Jesus was fully divine, where he was a part of God and so forth. The Jews couldn't go for that. They only believe in one God, revered Jesus, some of them did, yes, certainly, saw Jesus as a great prophet like uh, like Moses. And so that's what the scripture we read in Matthew about the wise men coming and finding Jesus at home, about the angel speaking to Joseph, and then about Joseph and Mary and the new baby fleeing into Egypt to be saved from Herod. We lost the Jewish interpretation and the symbology 
when the Roman Empire, with their Greek and Roman pantheistic views of many deities, many sem demigods, they had all kinds of special people who were fathered by a god. Even their emperor they saw as fathered by a god. And so that's what we inherited. The symbology of Matthew and the other nativity story in Luke, which is totally different, we have figured out with modern scholarship kind of what that symbology was meaning. Certainly the terror flight to Egypt to save Jesus from being killed in the massacre of the innocents was relating that to how Moses got the children of Israel out of slavery in Egypt, fleeing the Pharaoh, which was parallel to Herod. We see those things. We know that the Jews oftentimes would represent a birth by having an angel visit and announce as if it's a divine birth. But they didn't believe in having a child any other way than a man and the woman. However, it was symbolic. To the Jews, they never believed in original sin. That idea came out in the 300s also. To the Jews, every birth was sacred and was beautiful. So Saturnalia continued through many years. In spite of all of the religion that we've inherited with it. But the Bible scholarship helps us, and it helped me because it was confusing to see two different nativity stories. Which one is right? What does it mean? How do we see things literally? How can that be? Maybe you have confusion about your religious upbringing or the lack of one, but none of us can escape the Western civilization culture that we have learned with our beliefs about God. So let me set it straight how I've come to believe, and you're free to believe however you like. But I'm going back to Jesus and his teachings, because that's the one thing that hasn't changed. Certainly everything else has changed. We all like electricity and indoor plumbing and the internet. We don't hold on to any of those practices and systems of the first century, or the second, or the third, or the Dark Ages, or the Middle Ages. But what hasn't changed is the, that old theology that came from Catholicism in the Roman Empire. But here's the thing, it's okay. We, nobody set out to deceive us, confuse us, or lie to us. We've done that ourselves, because we haven't appreciated that they thought the best they could through those years. There weren't even books at the time of Jesus. People were illiterate for the most part. There was an imperial domination system in place where, yes, the wealthy were a few and far between. The rest of the people were just flat out poor and illiterate. And so things have changed, but Jesus' teachings haven't changed. The original Jewish ideas which were his and remain with me today are that we are born whole, healthy, pure. What is born in us, divinity is born in us, just like it was in Jesus. What we hope to birth through our preparations of Advent is the awareness of our divinity, the awareness of the power that God can give us if we open to it, the awareness of love and kindness and patience, the awareness of tolerance and living in peace with other people. That's what can be born in us. The Jews didn't believe in a punishing God. Just like we teach in unity today that we're not punished by our sins, we're punished for our sins. Those of us over 40, Joey, can look back and see plenty of ways that we have punished ourselves. 
And that's why the Jews every year, they, they believe in uh, seeking forgiveness and atonement from other people, of making amends, making things right, keeping their sa- slate clean in the book of life, so to speak. We believe that too. We believe in spiritual practices that will keep our awareness growing inside. You know, Jesus, when you read the scriptures, there are lots of stories of him going away to pray and being centered. So you see, we've kept many of the traditions of Jesus, along with the feasting and the merrymaking, and let's keep it all. I want to share with you what some that have been in some of our classes or in sessions have already heard this, but... A lot of people will lament that um, the family values and the worship of Jesus is gone from Christmas. Well, here's the thing. It never really was. Do you know the Christmas that we celebrate and when we sing our carols, when we sing our songs, when we talk about Santa Claus, and when we decorate our Christmas trees? Do you know when that started? in the mid-1800s. You see, Christmas got to be so aggravating to some of the church leaders that they banned it. In England, Christmas celebrations were banned in the 1600s, and of course, when the Puritans came over to New England, they had a ban here too. But just like you guys, when I say during greeting time, just instead of getting in, clogging the aisles, uh, turn to the person next to you and just greet them. I tried that once, and everybody yelled, no. (laughs) So there was kind of a 200-year battle, and the revelry was winning out. And so came the Unitarians. Those were the beginners of our new thought system here, Emerson, Thoreau, and so forth, in New England. Now, the Unitarians were not opposed to celebrating, but a lot of them were wealthy, and they were opposed to the looting and the destruction of property. And so they began writing poems about St. Nicholas down the chimney. Mm Mm-hmm. Take a look at that one. They began writing hymns. Some of the Unitarians were ministers. They wrote hymns. And so what we have now, uh, oh, children were encouraged to be nice in exchange for presents. And the people that didn't couldn't afford these presents, the Unitarians brought them presents and told them that Santa Claus brought them. The hymns, the silent night, the angels, poems, and the wonderful story about Ebenezer Scrooge. Charles Dickens was a Unitarian. Do you know that in a rather short time they succeeded? They brought the tree indoors and and decorated the candles there, and suddenly Christmas was about family values, staying home and quiet with the children, peace, goodwill to all. And so we've come a long way, and we've come through a lot. But the idea is, what does it mean? What does it mean? What is born in you now? Every moment is a fresh, new moment when you can call your thoughts and calm your thoughts and say to yourself, what am I birthing today? What am I thinking about? What am I saying? What am I doing? Am I representing the true nature of Christmas to celebrate the birth of Jesus to celebrate what we know to be true of his teachings. What am I birthing? And here's the thing. Every moment is a wonderful place to start. There's no reason to look back on the past and beat yourself up. That low self-esteem idea was started in the Roman Empire all those hundreds of years after Jesus, too. We are all born very worthy And all we need to do is tune in to those qualities to receive them. So I just want to close with saying that Advent is a perpetual season. 
We are perpetually preparing. That's why we have classes here, Power Hour, our fun events, our various seminars and activities, the men's group, the women's group. Keep that joy going all year long. Keep preparing your heart for more and more and more love in every way. And so I leave you with a joy-filled wish for a very Merry Christmas. Thank you. And now is our opportunity to give back. We want to thank everyone who signed up in the previous years for Amazon Smile. As you know, they give us as a nonprofit center, a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of what you purchase, but those fractions have added up, and year to date, we have over $300 gifted from Amazon Smile. So thank you all so much for signing up for that. If you haven't already, it's free to you. you just go ahead, and they will list Unity at Pompano Beach is where you want to give those fractions to. And now, as you hold your gifts in your hand, we thank you for all the ways you contribute to this spiritual home. If you can hold your offering in your hand as we say this prayer together. With a grateful heart, I acknowledge God as source of all that is. Today, I let go of any concern of lack and allow good to unfold in my life. Good is mine. Good and more good is mine and ever increasing good is mine. Everywhere I go, I see this good, I feel it, I experience it, I freely give it, and it multiplies itself around me. And so it is. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, unto us born, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given.
exactly what you have to look forward to at our Christmas Eve service. That's this upcoming Tuesday. We'll have both Samantha, Natalie, and Peter with us. And we are looking forward to you, our chaplains as well, who are lining up ready for affirmative prayer. We have Nick over here, and we have Carmela. We have Catherine, Cynthia, and Olga. Thank you so much for your service. And now let's stand together as we say the prayer for protection. The light of God surrounds us. We are the light of God. The love of God enfolds us. We are the love of God. The power of God protects us. We are the power of God. The presence of God watches over us. We are the presence of God. Wherever we are, God is and all is well. on earth and let begin with me let there be peace on earth the peace that was meant to be with God as creator family all are we let us walk with each other in perfect harmony Happy
Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Make the Yuletide gay. From now on, our troubles will be miles away. Happy golden days of your faithful friends who are dear to us gather near to us once more through the years we all be together if the fates allow hang a shining star